Hello and welcome to live from America podcast uh, from the Comedy Cellar. This is Hatem. Uh, Norm Dorman have a meeting and he's running late, so I don't think he'll be here. But we have a better host. An uh, upgrade. going to help me out. Comedian and host of the political uh, autofit, uh, very funny show, political show. And he is Andrew Heaton. He's here. Hello. I'm like two and a half gnomes. Easy. 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 I'm glad to be back. <laughs> And these are one of the episodes that I really like. Uh, it's a topics that really interest me. Um, our special guest is a special agent. How about that? Mark Brandenburg. And he was a uh, police officer at Kansas City suburb for five years before becoming a United States Secret Service agent, where he served uh, for the past 22 years. Uh, uh, he served on the Presidential Protective uh, Division during the President Obama administration. And he have a very interesting book, which we're going to talk about, uh, uh, The Fence Jumper, we're going to talk about later. But he also was uh, supervising uh, the Vice President, Mike Pence. So a lot of talk uh, over there, too, you know. And he's here at the show. Welcome, Mark. Thank you so much, Hadam. Uh, and Andrew, good to meet you. And uh Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really happy to be here to talk about the book, talk about uh, current events, anything that comes up. With one caveat, I'm just going to let everybody know for my legal department and uh, for the media relations folks at the United States Secret Service, I do not speak for the U.S. Secret Service. These are my uh, my own opinions on things. And I will start there just to PYA to start it off at the beginning, and, but everything is on the table. So I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thanks. Well, and, and to clarify, you, you are actively in the Secret Service. You are not retired? No, I am still an active United States Secret Service agent. As a matter of fact, just a couple of days ago, I was protecting a prime minister here in Washington, D.C. for a country in Europe. So, yes, I'm still an active Secret Service agent. Uh, I've been on 22 years. Um, like like, like, he's, like Hatem said, is that uh, we got the, I was on the president's detail for five and a half years with Obama, and I was a supervisor for almost two years when Vice President uh, Pence was in office. Can, can you tell us who's a dick? Like, it doesn't have to be American. It can be <laughs> no. any of the foreign countries. Like, like is Angela Merkel just fucking awful? Like, well, like it's who called, do you not like? It, Andrew, it's called the Secret Service for a reason. <laughs> There's some things we keep to ourselves. And that's um, why you're not a Secret Service, Andrew. Like, <laughs> yeah. Unlike the Gabby Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Secret Service doesn't gossip. I, I wanted also, to be a Secret Service so bad. Job. And, and what, it's it's also funny because when when I wrote the book, that's what's funny is like my supervisors when they found out, oh shit, Brandenburg wrote a book. They were probably worried about the very thing that Andrew brought up. It's like, what did he write about? <laughs> it's fiction. So uh, they, they yeah, were you you have a president that. named like O apostrophe Bamon, <laughs> and, yes. and like and you're just like and then the dickhead and the whole time it's breaking. <laughs> yeah, yes, very thinly, very very thinly veiled. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and President Sidon is yeah. in the office now yeah no definitely this is i'm sure this is one of the things that you know it's come to people a lot especially we have a lot of guests that you know they always say that disclaimer you know which is understandable but you know i think we live in also a crazy world i cannot wait when a president comes in tv like for state of the union is like by the way these are my opinion i don't represent anybody <laughs> it's like you're the president <laughs> 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 yeah you represent all of us yes, yeah what's and, wrong with and, you <laughs> and i will say i will say that i've done a few podcasts now to promote the book and some, uh, some other shows and, and the, the, i will say for the secret service to their credit considering how our agency is and the culture of the agency they've actually been really cool about it so i'll give them props for that but the, i'm also aware of where to go and where not to go so um but that's just part of the things you, you gotta you're think you're not about. allowed again, to it, mention it, like the secret tunnel underneath the the, the, the Lincoln yeah, center or yeah, whatever I, Exactly. I can't give away all the, uh, you know, the secrets, all the uh, uh, behind the scenes or the conspiratorial theories. I can't I can't validate those for anybody, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, but you know, maybe we'll retire. We'll, yeah. <laughs> so this, is how, this is how the show is going to be today. We're going to try to make you yep. say something and you're going to try to run away. But we're going to get you eventually. No, no, you're going to so, get me. I know. you. <laughs> so how how do you like, first of all, how do you become a secret agent? Uh, or in the U.S. Secret Service, like, uh, was that always your dream? Like, what, what did you, uh, how, how did that become for your journey? And in general, because I know a lot of people, it's cool, but people don't, don't think about it as, oh, I want to be a secret agent. They just like, it happens, like, kind of like the FBI, you know, but I'm assuming that you have to be very, very secretive. I don't know. Like, what's, how do you become it's, it's interesting. 
But what's interesting, and it, like the thing is, it's like at the end of the day, we're cops, so we're not really that far removed. We're just you. That, so I became a police officer out of college. I played football at a small college up near Kansas City. I just wanted to stay in the area. Became a police officer with the designs in my head. Now this is I graduated college in '96, so in my head, I'm like I eventually want to do FBI, Secret Service, something cool. Like like you said, let's not kid ourselves. You're a 22 year old guy. Most of it's just because it's really fucking cool to be a Secret Service agent or an FBI guy. Well, after five years, we did a search warrant with the Secret Service guys because uh, the Secret Service also investigates financial crimes. Um, that's actually how we were founded is is counterfeiting and stuff. So we did a search warrant. We helped them with it. Uh, and the guys are just good guys. And I just remember something as simple as that. I started talking to them and then I started the process. Um, now, the, the hiring process takes about a year and a half. Back then, it may be a little more streamlined now because communications is better. And I literally walked in to the Kansas City field office after typing up <laughs> the uh, this is the '90s, typing up my uh, my my all these sheets of, uh, of of the application, and then you start the process, which includes interviews, testing, physical fitness tests, and the key and the most troubling and difficult part was the they do a background investigation that's really thorough but it's the polygraph that's always the one that people find interesting because we're talking about five and a half six hours of, of being polygraphed because they got obviously when you're given the responsibility of being armed next to our leaders uh we barely be able to trust you it's gonna be more than just okay you're a good boy scout or whatever we also gotta know that you you have integrity and that we can trust you because we you can't investigate everything, so you got to know you can trust the person. And those polygraph tests are brutal. So, and the people that do it are very good. Can, can I ask, Mark? I like I. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that we quit using polygraphs, at least, at least in court, because they weren't reliable enough. So, is, is it partly just to see like how excitable you are by certain topics, or or do do they actually believe that it is like a foolproof honesty test? No, I think what they're well, you're. I, I, I yes, in in a in a court of law, it's different because obviously. You don't have a right to be a Secret Service agent. You don't have a right to be an FBI agent. So there's a dip, you don't have that standard. So at that point, if, if a person's showing deception and we can't give you a top secret security clearance, which you, you're going to need. And so once again, it could be something. And one example that it comes up with is there's a question. This is a great question that I thought they asked it was, have you ever done something caught for? But if you had been caught, would have been a felony, meaning you got away with it. And if, and if, to your point, if you really want the job and you're excited about the job, you're going to have a higher reaction. You're going to sweat. Your heart rate's going to grow up. Your chest is going to compress. You're going to go into fight or flight mode because you want the job and you know, oh shit, they're on to me. Or if it's drug, a lot of it's drug use and stuff. But like, let's say you were a kid and you, you stole a car and went for a joy wire, wrecked it, but the cops never caught you. Right. Mm. So now you go on and you live a great life and you've got a great marriage and everything's fine. But you decide I want to be a Secret Service agent. Now that question comes up and you remember that. And that's when your reaction is. So the Secret Service may not, or whatever agency is polygraphing you, they may never know what that thing was. They just know that you were full of shit and they're not going to bring you on. So that's that's what they're trying to cover. OK, I, I would fail this test, not just because of the felonies that I've done, but like I, I read an article recently that like like uh, laws have become so diff profuse that the average American commits like three felonies a day. It's just that they're not prosecuted or something. So if they asked oh, me, I'd be like, of course I have. Apparently we all have. I downloaded MP3s in high school that were illegal. Like, yeah, like you could, you could prosecute me if you really wanted to. Yes. And and, and I, and look, I was not a polygrapher, so I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I will know. I, I will say this. That's one of the things when you, when you're doing a polygraph, there's not a lot of nuance to it. It's like, if I ask you a question, it's a yes or no answer. Right. Mm, okay. And I had the same reaction. I was like, well, that's pretty there's a lot of gray area in this too yeah. um so i think what you know i don't know exactly how it works i don't know all the nuances of it but that's basically what they're trying to decipher is are you are you a deceptive person are you a person that we can trust in that situation because once again you don't have a right to have that job so if there's any gray area we'll just there's a, there's more people that will want to come on that we if we don't think you we can put you in that position we're not going to bring you on uh and you're going to find that around the board I would imagine it's the exact same way at the FBI and these other places where you have uh, these responsibilities and these kind of serious matters that you got. And because once again, there's always going to be behind back in the, I think it's different now, but back in the nineties, the rule of thumb was for every something like 500 to 700 applicants, only one person would be hired. Now I don't know if that's true or that's yeah. like a myth or whatever. That sounds high, but 
uh, it, the idea though was it's like we can be we can pick and choose who we want to bring on, uh, and we don't, have to be. Don't you want like somebody though in that gray area? Like if I'm going in a fight or something, yeah, I want that one crazy guy. Like don't You're you right. like, hey Jim, go check. You go check <laughs> that bag. <laughs> no, no, there was. They actually bring up a good point because I remember when I was interviewing with the Secret Service, he's like, the uh, the agent that I was talking to, one of the supervisors in Kansas City, is like. Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't want people that have ha have no life experience. We don't want people yeah. who come here who haven't done anything. And, and trust me, no one was more surprised than my college roommates and everybody that I knew when they found out I was a Secret Service agent down the road because like Brandenburg. No way, uh, because we don't really we want people with life experience. Yeah, you don't want somebody that's been sh you know kind of sh you know secluded and in 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 their little in shell and not out there experiencing life. So. As long as it's out there not doing something you know, egregious they shouldn't be doing. But they're not – I mean, like, for instance, I think on spring break back in the 1994, I was arrested. I was drunk as hell. I was a kid, you know. And uh, I got thrown into – back then, thrown into like the drunk tank, and it sucked. It was like the work – because I we got thrown in so early, I sobered up by the morning. So everybody else is still hammered in the drunk tank. And I'm like, shit, this sucks. So I never did that again. But I had to admit to it. Like, when I was getting hired as a service, I go, hey, look. When I was like 21 or so, I was down in Padre Island on spring break and I got a little out of hand and I got through and it didn't stop me. Now, if I lied about that, that that, that been made enough to go to kick me out. And that's the thing. I tell this to young people applying. Just tell the fucking truth, because you, you, a lot of times the stuff, if you just admit to it, it probably is not enough to get you bounced. So well, and also like. Like I I I worked for the federal government for a brief period of time, and uh, don't try to sound cool. No, 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 I, I'm not cool. For the record, <laughs> so not cool. I'm the least cool person here, including Gnome, who's not even here. But like one of the things that I noticed is federal employees are not in the habit of making more work for themselves. I don't think anybody is, yes. right? So it's not yeah. like when you go through that process, if you're like, yeah, I did this thing, I was never prosecuted. They're they're gonna go. Well, I guess I'm going to take time out of my week to try and get you arrested, even though it has nothing to do with this job. That's not going to happen. Like, you might not get the job, but you're not going to go to jail. They're, they're just, that's not going to be, unless you did something heinous, like murder somebody, they're not going to like, like go, well, let's shut down this whole thing and turn it into a you prosecution. That's a pretty astute observation. And you're probably exactly right. That, yeah, uh, yeah it had to be something really bad. Like, it had to be like Manson level type stuff before they're going to, they're going to go, okay, I'll go out of my way and see if we can fix this. There, there was a comedian <laughs> friend of mine, maybe Tim, you might've met him at some point, Jason Weems uh, from, from DC, very funny comic. And and he, he would talk about how like you watch CSI Miami where like CSI, whatever. And, and they're like, Hey, FBI, this is our turf. You get out of here. And they're like, no, no, it crossed the County line. It's our turf. And then Jason's like, I worked for the government, and it's much more like, that's not my job. That's Bill's job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <be> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's, it's like the one police department that has that that one town drunk that's always a problem. And yeah, you drop them off in the other district. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That, that may happen. On, it may have happened on occasion. Um, but yeah, you're, I think you're, that's a pretty astute observation. Yeah. What you, what you see in Hollywood sometimes. Plus, at the FBI, I always liked like the, uh, Die Hard movie, the original Die Hard, when the FBI guys come in there and they're just complete dicks, and they're just telling the LAPD, "It's like this is ours now." It's like if they did that to the actual LAPD, the LAPD would tell them to go fuck themselves yeah. <laughs> because you know if, if you, everybody's got to play in the same sandbox. So I always like that. The also that, that go the for it. We'll that. just work on parking. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> we're all, all going to yeah. knock yeah. off at three p.m. Terrific. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, you want to deal with Hans Gruber? Go for it. You, you got it. <laughs> So you get into the Secret Service, you apply, you go through a lot of tests. So I'm sure like, you know, there's criteria to begin with, because I remember I met kind of had the same your story. You know, I met a couple of I never wanted to be a secret agent until, you know, I met them. I was like, oh, my God, they're so cool. They were actually it was a. A president, no, not somebody was running for president and it was a, their fundraising. And they hold it at the cellar, at the comedy cellar. And I was there and it's like all these cool guys. So I decided to wear a suit too and just try to belong that day. And at the end of the day, I asked him like, just hey, slip in, you... just slip in the back with the secret yeah. service cohort. Like maybe you could just get in the car. And they no, because notice. I was, I was deal, I was the manager. I was dealing with them, you know? So I was like, oh, well us as secret service together, what's the plan of protecting? And I was like, just go away. But anyway, I asked him the same question that you asked him. How do you become a secret? I was like, you know, try the FBI. <laughs> it's not going to happen for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know there's uh, some uh, uh, some choices, but 
So you get into the uh, the Secret Service and then you realize at what point they tell you like, okay, you know what? You're going to jump in front of the president or whoever you're protecting if something happened. And you're like, oh shit. <laughs> like, how do you have yeah. that switch? How do you know actually that you're going to do it? How did they know that they're going to do it? What kind of training, if you can talk about, you know? Well, yeah, well, the training, the training is what the key is. And so you do lots and lots of training, just like, um, um, I always, I like a lot of stuff back to sports, playing football or something. It's like, you just, you, you train and train and train until you don't even think about it. Right. And so there's a little bit of that now also, and I tell, I've said this before in other podcasts is that, um, Today, compared to like back when the attempt on Reagan or you go back to the, the JFK assassination, the way we operate now is so much more effective, which is why I think we've been so successful, you know, the last 40 years is our planning, our pre-planning. So really, I think a lot of us now are like, like the guy, if we did our job beforehand, it never comes to that. Obviously, if it does come to that, you do what you have to do. But once again, it's going to be reflex. It's like you hear that. And even in the training, you'll see if you ever – some of the training will do they'll they'll mirror those or they'll they'll replicate those situations and you you're just instinctively doing that and the idea is that once again to get that reaction is that the primary concern our our primary concern is our protectee is the vice president president whomever so that's where the primary concern is at um and you just that gets drilled into you and after you know years and years and years of that when but you're, they put like uh, a frame of a picture of a president that you like so you can jump in front of him or not the president. <laughs> you're there at the training why. facility. You're like, I know he wasn't president, but I have a soft spot for Barry Goldwater. Could you maybe <laughs> find a, a thing for him? Just imagine yeah. you protecting Washington, you know, like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I've had this one of the most, probably the most common question we get as agents from the public and everybody is what if it's somebody you don't like politically? And you really don't think about the politics of it at all, which is funny. Like, uh, you, you really just don't. And then you were talking about earlier, uh, Andrew, about I mean, some, of these, some of these guys' dicks or what. Like, the vast majority, I've never run into a protectee that's been kind of an asshole. Now, you may have a, some of them have a bad day. Maybe that day they're, you know, they're under pressure and maybe they're a little short with you or something. But I, in my experience, now, I won't talk about stories of the past. I've heard some stories. But uh, personally, uh, my experience has been they they know we're there to help them out. They know we're there they're to not going to be dicks family. to you. Do, do they like <laughs> every few years somebody comes out with like a a, a tell all? Uh, and mm-hmm. I, I've not read any of them, but I like I, I used to work in, in cable television, and somebody had just done a tell all, and it was like about Hillary Clinton at the time or something like that. Um, and the implication I got again, I didn't read it. The implication I got was that some of the people that that you're protecting will basically like use you as valets, where they're like carry that bag. Is like, am, am I? Is that? Do they ever do that, or do you have like a very clear? We're here for your safety. We're not here to carry your luggage. Yeah. So I know that that thing, that kind of type of thing, does happen on occasion. But we make it clear, and that's something you need to make clear. Is like, hey, that's not our role. Our role right. is not. And they have staffers and people like that that can do those sort of things. Now, you would never see that on a bigger a bigger detail, like the president or vice president detail. But uh, you will see – occasionally somebody might request that on a smaller detail. I mean, it's happened to me before, and I just, I'll, I'll just decline and, you know, uh, and let the staffers handle it. You know, because right. – and then they re- usually they realize what the mistake was, that you got to be concentrating on what your job no, that, is. No, that it's, makes sense because, like, yeah. I, I've been to events – before where there's i assume secret service agents and you guys are facing the crowd you're not looking mm-hmm. at the guy speaking and yeah. you're very serious and you're doing this oscillating fan thing just yeah like i, I was at a, an event here in austin the other day and like just looking like a fan for 45 continuous minutes and like i assume that like it doesn't work where they're not talking anymore Why no one's allowed to shoot the them and then service. you guys could carry luggage <laughs> like you have to be vigilant at all, all times right that's correct and what what the mistake that some people make is too like with the uh, on the president's detail, for instance, the presidential staff people will have earpieces in to help so they can communicate. And the public, <laughs> and you can imagine, most of the staffers don't look like Secret Service agents. You know, the Secret Service agents are going to be doing shoulder shrugs or something. You guys are you a know? lot more fit than the <laughs> average staffer, for well, sure. Conf- you, you'd be surprised if people get confused. It's like, is that guy is it Secret Service? And the guy looks like he's 17 years old. He's got an earpiece. It's like, no, that guy's picking up their luggage or yeah. doing something That's else. That's an intern. Them. That's Skippy. <laughs> exactly right so the staffers but that staffers like to look like us as much as possible i think sure. so which is but which is kind of funny i do think when when you get just like you get training about like what to do i think the president also get training is like listen you can be a dick to this guy this guy but not <laughs> this guy 
Yeah. It's going to protect you. You have a gun, you know. So I uh, a couple of more questions on that, and then we're going to move to the political side of it. But, you yeah. know, the first one is like some, like I see, I understand the difference between a bouncer and security and secret service. You know, we see like mm -hmm. celebrities with bouncer, huge guys, big guys, but they don't move fast. So we, I get that. Like the idea is to bounce off them if you try to protect, you know, versus you need to speed, you need to be, you know, stuff like that. So when you have a president with certain, uh, you know, physique, like, like say president Trump, very tall, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, I mean, he, like most of the time he looks taller than a lot of the secret service, you know, how do you yeah. do stuff like that? Like, um, and why is the secret service usually they look like they are in shape, but not like boxes, not like muscle on top of muscle. Not like yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you'll you have like the, the guys who are yeah muscle on top of muscle. We call them kind of assault team members. Our, they're like our slot guys. But yeah, if you see guys, a lot of times they're fit, but they're not. Yeah, they don't look like they're not like like veined out and, you know, crazy jacked sometimes. But. But also the, the vast majority, and also some of our best, we have, uh, you know, sometimes you'll have a female agent. She's not real big, but I've, some of the best agents I've worked with because it's about planning. It's about the, it's about the totality of the protection plan. And to your point about the difference between a bodyguard, you know, some big burly guy walking behind Britney Spears and one of us, you know, he's in a purely reactionary mode. Like he's sitting there and he's got, and part of it's also probably imposing his will, you know, just having that deterrent factor by being that big. I mean, and we talk about, command presence and you know you're uh, andrew was saying about how we're scanning the, the the crowd having that command presence there has been studies done before where we've had incidents where people with mentally ill who who decided not to do something because they were like shit i don't want to mess with these guys yeah and how you present yourself but do you like we, oh go ahead sorry sorry i didn't mean to interrupt no no no, no you're fine no i was just going to say that the planning and all the things that go into a protect a protective assignment is so much more advanced than what you see in other things because we have some more control over the environment we're there well beforehand, before a protectee shows, before the president shows up, uh, well beforehand, and people are getting screened. And there's a lot more that goes in. But if somebody's big as Trump, like what? What's is there a difference? If somebody's big, the difference you're going to have to do is you're going to make sure the people that on the detail that are right around them can handle that, because that's the other thing. When you're training, uh, once again, like I said earlier, you're primarily concerned about the protectee, right? And to, and you're right. All the Trump family, they're huge. They're much bigger. You know, Mike Pence says, you know, you can pick up Mike Pence is not a big guy, so you, you could. If, if for some reason you had to try to drag him out of there for some reason, it's not, it wouldn't be that much of an effort. With the Trump, you might have to get some help from one of your buddies because he's just a big person. So when you're training, you got to take that into account because you're right. It's rare that you see a guy that size as president. Uh, but when you do, it, it trust me, when he, when he came into office, that was certainly a concern is that we need to, you know, the contingencies that go into how we're going to handle a person of that stature is, you know, and that size is going to be something that's going to be you know, worked into the, the overall plan. Um, Mark, when you're, when you're part of the detail for the president or the vice president, like, cause they're hanging out with you, I assume quite a lot. And, and, and it, it sounds to me like you're assigned to a specific person. Like you don't punch into the secret service factory and they go, well, today you're, you're handling, you're hanging out with Mike. Like, like, do you become buddies with him? Like, are you hanging out with Obama? And he's like, Oh, Mark, we're uh, going to get Subway. Do you want some uh, Italian beer? Like, <laughs> like do, you, do you eat lunch together? Like, like how, how close are you? Or are, are you just like their furniture you're guarding? Uh, I, I think, well, I, you, what you'll find is in a large detail, talking to the president, vice president particularly, there's so many people and we all kind of look alike, short haircuts, suits. Now they'll get to know the supervisors, the people that are right there. Like you'll see a lot of times, if you watch footage of presidents, you'll see the same face behind them a lot of times, uh, a detail leader or something. They'll get to know them really well because they're working with them. That's the main line of communication in a big detail. And they'll record, like I was with Obama for five and a half years. I know he rec he would go up uh, down the stairs. He'd see me. I have no doubt he recognized me, but he didn't know who I was. Whereas when I was with Pence or even if you, like a smaller detail, there's other details because we protect a lot of other people. In a detail, we have less people and it's less congested with all this personnel. You do get to know them a little bit. I and mean, there's been protectees in the past who I've gotten to know quite well. Um, and you're not like all chummy, but it's like you find it, you find you do have a lot in common. Like, especially if they have, you know, if guys were in the military, like if one of the, if one of the protectees is a former Marine and you need to have, oh, am I allowed to say former Marine? I hope the Marines don't come after me. Uh, but the always a if, Marine, <laughs> always always just, always they're a just Marine. not active at this moment. Exactly. Oh, shit. They're coming at me. Uh, and and you had a like a one of our guys. A lot of our guys are foreign military, and then one of our guys is from that branch. Then that's always like, helped with a connection. Um, I've seen that happen in the past too because they have that 
that kind of tie. So and you picks, can get to know the protectee pretty well. Who picks the protectee? Like, do you guys pick a straws and like, oh man, I got pants. Oh, no. Nah. <laughs> Well, you can assign so that we have different divisions. So if you get assigned, it, we always, it's almost cliche with us, the needs of the service. So if we need, you know, once again, talking about Trump or the Bush family or the Obamas, you know, you know, some families have lots of children and grandchildren and stuff. So you may need more agents to cover all the family members, whereas others may come in, you don't have that issue. Um, so it's just where you're needed. So I went to the president, the president's detail during Obama's years. And then later when I got promoted, I went to the vice president's detail. Uh, but there's sometimes, yeah, you'll have, you, you won't get, get promoted and go to vice president. Yeah. Well, so I the, mean, <laughs> the less important people, the more you, you get paid. <laughs> you get a longer lunch break. Maybe. You get a longer lunch break. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, in the, the vice president's detail, those guys work just as hard. They get, they're not the, like, there's a lot of rivalry and stuff. They're not the JV or anything. They're just as good as the guys in the presidents. Like I said, it's the needs of the service. And so what happens is, hey, we need you over here. It's like, well, let's go over there, whatever you guys need. So uh, it's kind of like um, the way it works sometimes. And yeah, and to your point, though, sometimes you won't get the place you want to go. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that that's how it, like, what is the perfect job? Like, what's the good job, the dream job at a secret service? To be with the president? Or is it to be with like somebody who travels a lot? Like what's, what's a dream job? Well, that's a good question. I never thought of that. Um, I would say, I, mean, I can only speak personally because it's different. There's a lot of different things within the service. One of the cool things about law enforcement generally and secret service, uh, particularly there's a lot of different avenues you can take as far as where you want to take your career. One of the things I like to do, or why I always like to do the advances. So I like the protecting that travel a lot. And if I had to go out and do a site advance or go to a lead advance, or I wasn't, transportation so i drove the i drove the quote unquote beast with obama you know the, the limo um doing those things i really enjoyed so the travel was a part of it i like now and i'm 50 now i wouldn't want to do i don't want to travel as much now but back when you know 10 15 years ago i loved it um so to me that's really but other people may feel differently like other guys talk about the counter assault team guys they're some of our best people and they love the they got the guns and they got the cool equipment and they got the best training and, and they get to train with a lot of people in the military, special forces types. And so they get a lot of really cool exposure to things. Um, so, that, that, you know, so it just depends on the agent, I think, as far as what they want. Do do ex-presidents get and tend to keep secret servicemen for life? So like is, is Jimmy Carter right now? Is there a guy who's like, it's going to be old age? I swear to God, I'm not going to let any bad guys get Jimmy. Like, does, does he still yeah. have secret service agents? Yeah. So the uh, yes, he still has protection. So the law basically up until George W. Bush. Now the law says you have 10 years after you have secret service protection 10 years after. Now, in reality, every president's going to sign an order that keeps it going. So it's still protection for life. It's just the law changed. It used to be for life. So the, the former presidents, the former first ladies have basically a protection for life. As far as that question is concerned, like I know with Reagan, when he retired, they had there's a story of an agent who was a really good, uh, he's a really good horse rider. He's really good on horseback and Reagan's would go out to the ranch. And like, this guy was just so good that he was there for a very long time. Cause he was used so useful there. And, and, and like you said, from my understanding is they actually grew to be pretty close, pretty close. Um, but I don't think there's any agents that stay with like, say, let's take the Bush family. I don't think there's an agent, like a, a, a boss that, Hey, my guy's got to stay here. They may stay there for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's not like a lifelong thing, but their protection is for life. You know, we'll Although the I think they, they can turn it down, right? Like one of my friends kind of knew the bush, like the, the senior bushes. And according mm -hmm. to him, uh, uh, Martha Bush, the elder Bush, uh, like was like done. She's like, I, we don't want this anymore. We've been out of office since the nineties. And like, like yeah. George, George H W Bush was like, don't tell her we're going to have her case <laughs> like, like had like, and she realized what was happening and like gave everybody a tongue lashing, but there's, there's some <laughs> amount of discretion on their end. Right. Yeah. I'm not, I'll be honest with you. I don't know a hundred percent on that. I know in most protectees with the exception of the president, vice president, you can decline protection. Uh, like I would, it's awesome. I would love to no. have like, I go camping. Somebody will fucking shoot bears. Like this yeah. is awesome. <laughs> well, I think I, I agree. I'm kind of with you. It's like, wait a second. I get, I get protection. I got a car waiting for me. It's like, like, I don't want to go anywhere. Uh, I want to sign off on this, but yeah, there are situations where lower level people or can sign off on protection if they want to, if it's offered to them. Do third party candidates get protection while they're running? Like will Jill Stein or whoever the libertarian is during the election have secret service protection? 
So during the, the campaign is an interesting monster. So it seems more art than science, and I'm not on the, at the table when this is done. But so that you have a there's Congress is involved, uh, and there's the DHS is involved to determine who gets Secret Service protection out of outside of like a, a not like the candidates, for instance. Like in the past, I protected, which shows you how long I've been doing this. Like when John Kerry was running, I was protecting his 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 wife at the time, and I was just a, a three year. I've only been on three years. Um, so you do have that, but like this one's a little weird this year, but we didn't pick up anybody outside of like, we didn't pick up Haley. We never picked up RFK. We never picked up anybody this year. So it's just kind of odd because now we got the president Biden going to go against pre former president Trump. So we have details for both obviously already, which as a secret service guy <laughs> makes our life a little easier because if we had picked up two or three other candidates, you can imagine the manpower issues become way worse. I th I think uh, if they won the nominee, they start getting protected. Yeah, so no, if they yeah you know, they won the nominee. I have a funny story that. about that. I'll tell you, but off the air, I cannot say it on the air. But uh, good. So, so if we if we move on to like you, uh, well, first of all, you drove the beast, right? So did you ever yeah. like, get a uh, stopped in a traffic light and tell the like, officer? Oh, I'm sorry, I was I thought I was still driving the beast and. No, <laughs> no never. Sorry, I was like, yeah, no, you, yeah. When you're driving that big thing, and you're, you're you're well aware of it, it. It really is no nothing. I've never driven another vehicle quite like that. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what do you what what's your thoughts on you know the political aspect of like trying to get like Secret Service to be witnesses in trials, uh, talk about presidents, um, you know the limo, you know the the the, the secret service is driving the limo for Trump was in uh, January six was just testifying. You know what's your mm -hmm. thoughts on that? It might it must be something that you know because you want to form that relationship, in my opinion, with your protector. Yeah. You know where I agree. I trust you. You trust me. Like, but that's kind of like dying now. If this continues, what do you think? Uh, I you think? I agree with you're saying. I want I want one more ca another caveat. I, I'm not part of the legal department. This is I'm going to give you my personal opinion and my professional opinion. I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Uh, so this is not the views of the U.S. Secret Service. But in my opinion, I agree with you. I think it's vital that you have a level of trust because you under you're in these people. You're in these protect these lives to a large degree. And they're living their normal life. And so they're human beings like everybody, you know, everybody holds people on pedestals. They're normal human beings. Um, and they're going to have, you know, just like anybody else, they're going to have, you're, you may overhear a squabble or a disagreement between family members or whatever. You, and they need to know. And we, I have a family. Nobody, everybody goes through those things. And I think they have to have trust in us to, to, to do our jobs, keep them safe. And know that 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 we are there that, that to assist them and help them, and they need to trust that we're not there prying into their lives or anything like that. That would if something like that, because the next thing that's going to happen is if I was a protectee, I'd go get these guys the fuck out of here. Because you know, if somebody yeah. went to and if somebody went to the newspaper because my wife and I got into a, a spat about something, and it gets out left out, I'd be like, I want these guys out of here. So now you're now you're hurting your protection because now you're pushing it out because they want privacy. They got to know that their privacy is held with just as much uh, seriousness as their protection is, and and it, and they got to they got to be able to rest assured that we're not there. Pri you know, we're government agents, but we're not there. To, they have privacy, and they're they're still citizens of this country, and they should be treated that way. And I have a real big problem, which is one of the reasons why you know we've had you know agents in the past or people in the Secret Service in the past. It's it pisses off the current agents if somebody goes out and starts t talking about their previous experience as agents, if, especially if it's a personal thing with a protectee. To me, that's a huge violation of trust that should be completely unacceptable. Uh, and like I said, the, all you got to do is put yourself in the in the position of that that leader. Uh, they they have to know for absolute hundred percent certainty that, that that their life is private and it's for them, and that these guys walking around with earpieces and sunglasses aren't aren't eavesdropping on them because if, if you do if you violate that it's all over yeah that's Andrew, a great point i've never what? thought about that before but like in the same way that we have certain protections for uh e executive um executive advisors I, I don't remember what the term is here but like basically you don't want people advising the president to immediately be thinking about uh, how does this affect me in three years? You want them to be in the moment. So there are certain protections mm -hmm. in place of like, yeah, that's not going to be disclosed. If it's if it's a, a private consultation between the president, and one of his advisors, it's only going to be disclosed if it's subpoenaed specifically 
uh, you know, if, if it's due to national security or whatever, because you need to have that. Yeah, that makes total sense. If I'm if I'm in some really weird, <laughs> fucked up alternate universe, if I'm the president and uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm like, oh, no, nah, I'm going to start talking about my mistress. You guys all take a lap and, you know, go like then there's a period yeah. of time where uh, I'm, I'm open to being shot by one would hope a jealous lover. And it's not only about yeah. getting shot, it's just like the whole relationship. I, I take it like one step further. I don't think they should be even subpoenas to, to, to testify. You know, you know what I think of Secret Service? You know, when you have that friend, like, and you're like in a fight, it's like, I'm going to kill him and he holds you. But yeah. you know, you're only doing this because he's holding you. If you let go, you don't want to fight. Like <laughs> you trust him enough that he's holding you the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like don't let me go yeah don't let me go so that's the same thing with like when the level driver is like oh trump will try to turn around with the beat with the not the beast i don't know what they call it now with that to go to it's like he wasn't really trying but he's like trying to look cool so like these things has to be secrets you know um but yeah i think the trust had to be there uh, that's 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 a major thing between you know something interesting i'm egyptian so, uh, like, there was an operation years ago when I was a kid. Uh, Mubarak had, like, four secret service, not secret service, but Egyptian secret service, which is very well known to be very good. And they were in, in Ethiopia, and he, get, he was under attack. And only four guys managed to deal with about, like, 25 trying assassinations because they were in another country. The first thing they did is to give these guys a raise and move them somewhere else because they said, now they know how you react. So we can't yeah. have you protect the president, which was very interesting to me. Yeah. Like, to me. I was like, oh, if you prove yourself, I want this guy. But like, no, these are like, this is based on science, based on studies, based on a lot of things. They didn't pick random guys. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah, and that's what, that's where like, yeah, tactics and, and those type of things and like how we react to things is a big, you know, and that, that's one of the things I've said in the past is you had to keep one thing you have to be aware of is situational awareness. You have to be aware that they're looking at us too, you know, <laughs> and, and they talk about this military uses the same process where if you're moving somewhere, you're doing something, uh, you have to be aware other people are watching people who, who may have nefarious intentions are watching and you got to be, a, uh, be aware of that of the, and not giving away the, the plan or giving away the farm to the, to the bad guys. Mark, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, you'll see the same secret service people behind or near the president. Uh, they'll they'll show up in footage and things like that. If I were a nefarious foreign power that was looking to just keep tabs on the president in case we ever had to do anything, I would just case all the Secret Service agents that I could identify. Uh, are are you when you're going to work? Are you like uh, are are you making sure that you're shaking off a tail? Are you aware of tails? Are are there uh, are there things in place to make sure you're not being followed or surveilled in order to indirectly get to the president's location? The the uh... That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, you're aware of it. You're aware of the sensitivity of what we're doing now. The good thing for us is, like I said before, at the end of the day, we're cops with a really cool name. Right. So uh, we're <laughs> I hate to, it, it's going to sound terrible since I am an agent, but it's like, frankly, if I go down, they could fill my spot with another very capable guy. Now, that said, I'm not I don't want anything to happen to me. And you're aware of that uh, all the time. Like and, and they're aware it's particularly what you normally see, particularly at places where you work, they're going to have things in place to make sure that, that yeah, you're not getting surveilled and things like that are identified. Because uh, I haven't heard of a situation where uh, that's happened to an agent. It's not happened to my knowledge, but it is a concern. Um, that, yeah, so far I haven't heard of any issues when it, when it comes to that. Because really our... Uh, I think the bigger the bigger issue of the surveillance and the, or, or the counter surveillance of the different things we do, the different measures we take to make sure that that our operational plans are still safe and and, and kept uh, quiet, we we do, and and I hope you know we also do use that to uh, protect our agents. But the other thing that happens is we're also given a lot of training throughout our career on how to recognize and combat uh, some of the ways that people can infiltrate or try to. Uh, the other concern is. And this happens for everybody in government. The other big concern is always uh, if foreign entity is going to try to influence you in some way or somehow, uh, let's say, blackmail you or get you compromised in some way. Um, so that's and that's where your personal behavior makes a big deal. Like if you go overseas and you hook up with somebody, it's a now you could you could see like you know the compromise that, that could happen. Um, and so 
or something like that. And those are, you know, all these different, and that's just the most extreme example, but there's other ways that they, you know, you gotta be aware of any foreign influence or any foreign yeah, way. I, I interviewed a, a former white house chef a couple of years ago, and I don't remember the exact story, but it was something like he was, I think he was, you know, like an assistant chef or something. And, uh, like he was just in a bathroom and somebody like slid a duffel bag full of cash over to him and, and like, oh, wow. was just, like something like that. And then like, he was like, okay. And then they like immediately walked to the phone, called the secret service was yeah. like, they just, and they were like, good job. Like, like that was one of our guys. We just wanted to make sure like, but it was like, there were sort of like, like mechanisms in place to make sure that someone was not on the hook from a foreign agent. Yeah. And that's all everybody, everybody at the federal level of government, uh, and particularly in certain agencies have, is, is keenly aware of those type of things. And that's a more obvious, you know, attempt there, but you know, a lot of times it's very subtle and that's why you have to continually have that kind of training to make sure people know when to recognize something, you know, what, I think, like, like how does it get more, like more subtle, like somebody just takes you out to dinner and you feel obligated to them. It could be anything. Uh, there's different behaviors, not to get specific, but like, uh, you know, let's say, uh, uh, you know, it could be any number of things, but the, 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 the easiest example and the most obvious one is like, if, she, if the girl's hitting on you, you're not that good looking. <laughs> There's yeah. a possibility. Man, you know, now motive. I'm thinking I'd be a great Secret <laughs> Service agent because that's always what I think. I'm like, what is she up to? So, so yeah, you have to be, you just have to be aware that people, other people might be aware, know what you're, what you do, and they may know, you know, what access you may have. And so you, any, but any, like I said, and that's where, you know, in government and we you've seen examples in news and stuff all over where uh, people who maybe didn't do those things properly, if, that, if they get compromised, then that's a problem. And it, it's going on all the time. And of course, now there's cyber and all kinds of other ways to, for people to get information. So um, it's harder than ever to to maintain that. But all you can do is con really that's what a training is about is, is conducting yourself in the proper way and being self-aware enough to know if to, to, to see these things. And like you're that, that chef you were talking about go to somebody go you know there's a report mechanism to go hey it's so and so or this phone number or that or whatever happened whatever the incident was you can report it so that it can be dealt with or at least looked into because what you might find is that that same situation is happening on numerous other occasions you want to go where i think there was an incident in colombia where if i'm not mistaken or secret service went to a strip club yeah and, yeah yeah. yeah, that yeah, was, that was me and Andrew. <laughs> that yeah, was, I guess well, yeah, that was that a really was, fun news week. That was a fun was news week. Cartagena, Colombia. There's yeah, everything kind of changed. And I was on the president's detail at the time. I wasn't there, thank God. According to my my wife, that was my wife's first reaction was, "Thank God you weren't there." And I looked at, I go, "What are you fucking implying?" <laughs> um, it was like Cartagena. Yeah, that was years ago. Uh, yeah, those, and that's what I was talking about. As far as that's what our concern is, is the compromise there. Obviously. Um, I don't think that the, the people involved were were working with any foreign governments. I think it was just guys, you know, making terrible decisions. But that, and also, it, it hurt the Secret Service in many ways because we had such a huge public trust. Something like that, you know, the, the public had this Boy Scout image of us, and then you have these guys doing that, and it makes us look bad. But also, that's your concern is when guys are doing that. That's why they're not on the job anymore because <laughs> you could be putting yourself in a position where you can be, you know, used in blackmail. And, and I think it was very interesting because not only they went there, they had a fight. Like they, you, you fought. Like, yeah, it was. And, bad, and, yeah, and it, it's it, the it, one place, like you said, like if, if a hot girl hitting on you, you have to question. Uh, and this is the other place that you always question a pretty girl hitting on you. It's a you can't. Well, ex yeah, you cannot. You, it's hard to beat human frailty. We if if humans can fuck it up, particularly guys can fuck it up. We'll fuck it up. So even even guys who who are usually pretty disciplined. But that was a big that was a learning moment because like in my twenty two years, nobody had ever seen anything like that. And it, yeah. and it was a huge public outcry, justifiably so. But I think a lot of it was also because people held us in such high regard. And then we do then something like that happens. And you're just digging yourself out of a hole. I think we're finally out of it. But, uh, so, so you, you mentioned the, the the Boy Scout image, which is you know in the line of fire, all that. Like that's that's yeah. the kind of like the, the American idea of the Secret Service. There, there's also I don't have this specifically for the Secret Service, but there's a sort of like jobs that have a lot of danger, like test pilots, Secret Service agents, things like that. I also assume that they self-select for high testosterone adrenaline junkies. So is there like a delta between the Boy Scout and the Adrenaline Junkie that got out of whack with those guys in Columbia? Or is that just, are they the outliers in terms of adrenaline and testosterone? They, I, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know. I, I think, you know, 
I, like I said, I always attribute it to the fact is, you know, they're in Colombia, they're there ahead of time. Uh, I wasn't there. I don't know the entire situation, but I think it was just terrible decision after two, one decision compounding another. And this was days. Now, not mind you, and just for clarification, the president wasn't on the ground. This was days. I'm, I'm not justifying. Although it. that I think his polling would have got up. I would like if, if it had been like, yeah, okay, Obama did a couple of body shots <laughs> off of some hookers. He didn't have sex with them. And he only did enough. Like he could have driven home. I would have been like, that guy's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you got your vote. But the uh, no, it's so yeah, it was a, that was a bad incident. Actually, for the book, that's where part of the premise of the book is actually because the character, the main character in my book, Fence Jumper, is, is a guy named James Ford. He's a suspended Secret Service agent for a a, a, a sex scandal in South America. That's the first premise of the book, based off of that to a degree, obviously. And then what happens is I have a um, a senator running for the presidency has his wife kidnapped. So he looks like a political victim. She escapes. James Ford finds her. And then they start investigating and it kind of goes from there. Uh, but that, but that's where that was the catalyst. Obviously when I was sitting in front, I had some ideas in mind for a novel. I was like, I really should use this. Somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Plus the other way is he's not, but he's suspended in the book. So that way I could get away with a lot of other stuff. I can make him do things that if he was an actual agent. I probably couldn't do, <laughs> but I could say, Hey, he was suspended. He wasn't acting on behalf of the service. And, so. and I, think, I think the fact that it's also, it's not only the boy Scout uh, image, it's that's also president Obama image. Like if that was Kennedy, you'll be like, well, of course, you know, <laughs> expect less, you know, uh, but you know, I'm sure a lot of other you know, uh, secret service around the world, like Gaddafi's all women uh, team. You know, something. yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, ever go that's... like to Russia and like your? I don't know what you call their secret service, but you know, like miracle and ice kind of like tension between you and them yeah. like, to work together. I some, haven't. You know, I've money. never been to. No, I've never been to. I've never been to Russia. I'm trying to think where. I've, no, I've been. No, I, I have taken a protective to China. Um. And this wasn't this was a cabinet level official, it wasn't president or vice president. And yet it is a little strange because I just found because the culture is so different. Like here in the military here or in a police department or something, we expect our people to make a decision. Whereas there, there's like one guy. And if he's not there, nothing happens. <laughs> so there's a very strange and there was a lot of they were giving us all kinds of shit about the weapons we were bringing to the country. And, you know, it was just one, you know, you know, dick measuring contest after another. So it's just like, get me out of here. I've never worked with Russia or anything, but you will, I've heard stories from people. I mean, sometimes they'll just, they'll just follow people there. When you're in these, some of these countries, you'll be followed and they'll even try to hide it. Um, so there's those, in those adversarial countries. So uh, yeah, That's there's always is, like, if there's like say peace talks, Israel, Palestine, like if two countries like or North Korea and us or, or any, like that tension, like you, I think this is another layer of the Secret Service that they have to de-escalate, no one but work together somehow. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, you may have, um, and a lot of it too is because and it can happen too when when other countries come here. Is you know, it's our jurisdiction, it's our house. I've gone to, I remember doing an advance in Poland, and they were great to work with, but they're very, they're former Soviet bloc, and. They're very, you know, not only humor, but they were they were great to work with as far as you knew shit was going to get done. But they had these plans for the motorcade that were just out of whack compared to what we want to do. So you're trying to come to, and you have the language barrier, you got the cultural barriers, uh, and you're working through that to try to find a compromise to make everybody at least mostly happy. So people don't realize a lot that goes into planning, uh, and eventually worked out great, and they were awesome. And I've worked with them a number of times since, but. Um, yeah, you do run into that stuff a lot. Even and you can have that in friendly countries. I mean, you can go to, as you can imagine, some countries have a have much more of a problem with weapons. And America, hey, we don't give a shit. Every, we got four hundred million of them here. But um, countries, you know, as far as like you know, uh, they may have a bigger issue with how we operate. They we may have an issue with. It. So you try to you got to compromise with these countries, whether they're coming here or we're going there. That's part of it. And like you said, I mean, like a lot of these people, they're professionals as well. These guys know what they're doing. Uh, and so you just have to keep working with that. Make, so the main thing is to keep sight of the fact that, hey, we're trying to keep everybody safe here. How can we meet in the middle yeah. and make it work out? And it was. It, it's amazing. Do you, do you think it always Gaddafi does. was fucking with Secret Service and he's like, I want a tent? <laughs> I could see it. Yeah, maybe. I mean, who knows? I just think he was batshit crazy. But uh... I, I like the idea, going back to Obama in Colombia, I like the idea of like Mitt Romney going, guys, we're going to go to Hooters. 
Don't tell anyone. <laughs> and then like yeah. drinks half a root beer and is like, what am I doing? I should drop out. I'm a hypocrite. I blame the sugar. <laughs> yeah, it was a sugar rush. Oh my God. I'm gonna call my wife. I'm so sorry. So That's so awesome. you know, you play sports, you know, you you done you coach, you do something. What what is next for like secret service agents? Like what's your next like you, you go a political career, you go to well, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep the writing thing. So far, the book has done pretty good. You know, for a guy who has no platform, just it's been. It, it got published like a, about a year ago. I gotta tell you, when I saw it, like the first time, this is how you know I'm gonna let you finish, but I'll tell the the uh, the, the listeners a story. Is like how we met. Is like it was through like a common friend, not even like common friend. Like he was uh, an Instagram. And he posted your book. And it was just something about it. And it's like, and you'll be in a secret. I know there's always layers when there's a secret agent and I like to read these books. So I Google and it's like, it's a really good book. So yeah, keep going. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's a, I don't know if you're familiar with Carl Hyacin. I kind of based it on Carl Hyacin's writing a little bit. Uh, nice. It's so, it's, yeah. Right, I'm going to read it, that alone. So it's funny? Yes. It's funny. It's a humorous political thriller. There's a president in it that tweets. There's um, so like I said before, we have James Ford and Kat Sterling. It centers around there's a, a metro cop um, who's investigating it, but there's also Russian agents. For instance, the senator happens his chief of staff who he's having an affair with happens to be a, a Russian double agent. So it's, it's a humorous political thriller. But the idea was to make a Carl Hyacin book set in D.C. So instead of Florida, it's Washington D.C. And and it's actually some of the feedback's been great. I was on Hugh Hewitt's show, and then I was on uh, a Robert O'Brien, Ambassador Robert O'Brien. Uh, who's a former national security advisor for Trump, read it, and he called it Veep Me Tals of Cards. It was a tweet, and I was like, that's a great summation, and I, I wish put, I had put thought that. Put that on the Amazon blurb right now. Yes, yeah, 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 I go. What? So, like, when did you start, of, when was the first time you're like, hey, I'm going to write a book? So I've always read extensively, even as a kid. I wrote when I was a little bit as a kid, but then, but then I'd always wanted to do that, and then I, I kind of had fits and starts, because I mean, anybody that writes knows it's hard as shit, and 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 you don't know if it's working. Like when you're doing it, you're hoping it's working. And I imagine it's just like comedy. It's like you're sitting there going, you know, comedy is obviously a live medium, so you guys are, you know, uh, had to work it in front of the audience. But you're like, you don't know when it works until you get feedback. As far as a writer is concerned, well, I started writing, and I just felt good about it. And also, it's about stuff I knew about. Like I could draw from experiences, funny experiences, and all kinds of. And I know Washington D.C. I've been in Washington 16 years. I know this town backward and forward. Uh, I know how they op- I know how things operate in the White House and and, and stuff. So I could use all that uh, to make to keep it real. And that's why guys like when Hugh Hewitt or a guy like, or a person like Ambassador O'Brien reads it, who are big in Washington insiders, they loved it. They understood what I was doing. That's when I knew I was onto something. You want to send it to uh, William F. Buckley, uh, Christopher F. Buckley's son. So w- William F. Buckley is kind of in the same vein as you, where he like. Yeah. Like, uh, or, hold on, excuse me, William F. Buckley's the old dead Republican. Yeah, that's right. He used to do uh, PBS and stuff. His son, Christopher F. Buckley, is is writing political satire. Like, I've I've read a couple of his books, and they're they're funny. And, like, you want to, like, touch base. And uh, if you want, like, I, I don't know him, but I, I don't know. I, I know a couple of people that are like, we should have more funny political stuff that's not yeah, preachy. Yeah. It would be great, yeah, because I've, I've used some people with mutual connections with uh, with, with certain – I won't name them, but like certain authors and other folks who – and even like one Hollywood actor uh, who I've – so I'm trying to get it – because I really do – now I believe in the writing. I really do think it's going to – it could go somewhere. And um, So we'll see what happens. And like the, in the book, yeah, it's, 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 it's done really well. And you know, like I said, it's just the, just the start of something. I'm already like 35,000 words with the first draft of the next one where I'm trying right. to use some of the same characters. And also – I'm incorporating some of the, I, I'm always incorporating some of what's going on in common political stuff now. So there's a, uh, you know, there's certain characters in there that people will recognize. So, so Mark, I am a far less successful novelist than you based on the stars you've got <laughs> on Amazon alone, but I've, I've written a couple of funny <laughs> novels as well. And, and one of the things that I find is that like, cause, cause I'm writing humorous novels. I want to mm-hmm. get myself into a humorous mindset. Uh, I'm, I may not feel funny, when I'm sitting yeah. down at my desk that day. So like I will sit down and read like Dave Barry for half an hour or I'll, I'll I have like, I have a whole wing of, of funny books in my library. Who are the people that like, do you try to read anybody to get into that mindset? And if so, who you mentioned Carl Hyacin earlier, Carl Hyacin's the, the most common one. Actually, but I usually read nonfiction, frankly, uh, mm-hmm. mostly not, but I also read a lot of thrillers uh, because 
that's what I was trying to incorporate. I wanted it to be, a, it's like, a, I call it a humorous political thriller because there is a lot of action. Thrillers also sell too. a lot better. So that's smart branding on your part. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's what I, <laughs> I'm it's significantly I better. <laughs> no, you're right. And, 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 uh, but that's also why if you look at the cover, when I, when, when they made the cover, I was like, I was key on, I don't want it to look like a Jack Carr novel or a Robert Ludlum or something like that, or a Clancy, because that's not what it is. It's a, it's more like, like I always thought the covers, going back to Carl Heisen, he always had those kind of covers, real simple, bright. So that's what we kind of went somewhere in the middle. Uh, but yeah, I would say Carl Heisen is really the only one. Like A lot of the other stuff I do is um, um, – it's, it's thrillers, or I or I read uh, nonfiction mostly, but but like that's the reason. But I also I think I have I'm not a comedian, but I, I think I, I I have an eye for some of the absurdity of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. And like I said, being immersed in it so much, you can see. And I there were some I put some scenes in there that are pretty close to reality of how it actually happened, <laughs> like some of the dialogue and things like that. Especially that's where I drew a lot of it's from the dialogue. Do you when you when you write something? Do you like? Is it in mind uh, your mind to have to make it like a, a movie or a TV show or like a, a part two. Uh, yes. Something like that. And uh, if you do, who would play the character? That's a great question. And, and I've, I've thought about, so like, as far as the, yeah, in my mind, I'm playing it like a movie. Like, you know, you're going scene to scene. Because my experience and Andrew, I don't know what it's like for you. This is the book. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know what it's like for you, Andrew, but like when I, you know, writing a book is so daunting. If you think about the big picture, it's almost too much for me to wrap my brain around, and it'll, it'll freeze me, or I can't because yeah. I get it's too much. So I just got to go. Okay, just nail this scene right here. Just nail what you know. I'll, I'll have an idea of what the next few scenes will be, let's say, and I know where I'm going with it, but I can't think about the entire thing because also I'll change as I go. I don't, I don't script it out too much. I like that. I knew, like, I knew the ending, the fist jumper. I already know the ending of my next book, and I know a lot of some a lot of components, but I don't have it completely mapped out. Because um, even like with Fence Jumper, I had this one the, the police character. His name's Derek Rowland, who's kind of an ode, a homage to a, my best friend, who's still a cop. I realized at some point when I was writing, I go, we need somebody else in here to kind of mix it up to, to have a kind of a, a parallel storyline. And so when I realized that, I, I did that. Uh, I, I put him in there and kind of went from there. But yeah, I find that. Um, I just gotta stick with the one you know, that that one scene and get that really down, and then I can move on to the next one. Which doesn't make for particularly fast writing. <laughs> I'm not the most efficient writer because I'm also it's, doing my other job. It is a slog. Like I, I have a lot of friends that are that are you know con content creators, writers, so on and so forth. And um, like occasionally somebody will tell me that they've written a book and they don't have a publisher, and and they like they comport themselves like a loser. And I'm like, dude. You congratulations on writing a book. Writing a book in and of itself is a very big accomplishment that yeah. indicates somebody of tremendous dedication to the track, the craft and creativity and self-discipline. And like it's it's wonderful if other things happen. It sounds like Mark, like you're you you've got wind in your sails, which is phenomenal. But yeah, writing a book is hard. What's easy, I find, is people that like to talk about the kind of book they'd write. That bit's uh -huh. really fun. Where you just kind of oh, like bullshitting yeah. and brainstorming out loud. Everybody enjoys that. And sitting down and writing it, that is tough. Yeah, I have. Like, like they say, writers write. So yeah. you can talk about writing all you want. And I remember, so this book took me about four years to write because for your very, and my mantra was, if it's the worst work of fiction ever fucking written, just finish it. That was, because that was exactly the same idea in my mind was, I just want to finish it. And if it sucks, it sucks. And that's when you put yourself out there. And now I have more confidence in it. But when I put it out there, I was a, I was an insecure little bitch about it. I was like, do you think it's any good? <laughs> You know, you know, what, what I find to be really helpful, Mark, is uh, me and my, my buddy Jennings, we've known each other 20 years and we, we met each other through writing. And like we will go to a Barnes and Noble when, when we're failing, when we can't get publishers or whatever, just go, how many books here do you think are worse than ours? And we're like, probably at least a quarter of them. Like, they're not all that good. Like, you pick up a couple and you're like, this is shit. How'd this get? Oh, because the guy's nephews with a publisher or whatever. So I, I just I remind myself like. At least I, I can't. I, I think I'm above the bottom twenty percent. Like I, I think I'm at least in the middle. And I think that's what you got to do. I think just for your own sanity, I just think about the quality of the writing. If I if I, if I feel like that I I wrote I created something good that I can be proud of, you got to go with that because I didn't do get into it to make a ton of money or to do anything like that. I just it was more just a life goal. It's like I want to complete yeah. this, and then but then you get the satisfaction. Like I said, writing sucks. Having been having written is really kind of great, especially when you start having people. 
people that you'd never met before read it and tell you what they thought, or they, maybe they picked something up out of it that they didn't expect. And, and to your question, by the way, I, I completely avoided, I would have the lead, it's, it's going to be cliche now, but Chris Pratt would actually be a really good James Ford. Mostly, Ooh. I don't picture him like, I don't picture Woodwatch. him looking like him. I don't picture him looking like him, but his kind of, that boyish kind of like charm that he kind of, he shows in like Gal- Guardians of the Galaxy, that kind of smart ass kind of quirky yeah. uh, uh, approach I like. And for Cat Sterling, I'd love to see like a little. Wait, hold on, because I've got a I've got a really good idea. Uh-huh. Have, have you seen Parks and Rec, Mark? Yes. Okay, so you know that Chris Pratt's like alter ego with his wife is Burt Macklin, secret agent. <laughs> yeah. Like you should tweet him and be like, "Hey, we've got the book. Like we could just rename the guy Burt Macklin, and there's an immediate yeah. tie-in. And like, yeah. let's see what happens. I'll, com- I'll complete. I'll completely change it if Chris Pratt would take the lead. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would yeah, but- watch Burt Macklin's Secret Agent. That, that is like, <laughs> sight unseen. I would go to that. I, I think one yeah. of one of the interesting things, and you asked me if it, if you went through the process when uh, you write about secret agents or try to create secret agents, a lot of people try to like, it's not James Bond. I have to be far away from James Bond. You know, I don't want it to be cool. I don't want it to. Did, did that cross your mind? Because everybody. Yes. Like, that, that's a great point because one of the premises I had was creating is I wanted every character to be fucked up. Every, there's not one character that has completely redeeming quality. Even the kidnappers are these former red, are these redneck guys who are kind of like supposed to kind of represent like a, a West Virginia MAGA type personality. And then they're, they're kind of a mess. So it's like, everybody's kind of jacked up. And I wanted James Ford, James Ford drinks too much. He's kind of a cad. He's, you know, because of the, because of the scandal, his wife's left them. So Instead of like you see in a lot of thrillers, the, the the protagonist is like this perfect guy. He's like a former SEAL slash, you know, Air Force pilot, whatever this, and he's just perfect. And I wanted James Ford to be just the opposite, where he just kind of accidentally falls into this thing and figures it out on his own, even though he's completely imperfect. Um, and that was kind of the idea behind part of the idea with and that's why I liked about Carl Heisen books, is that every character in there is kind of fucked up and that makes it fun because they're they're actually more relatable when they're human and they're not, you know, this superhero uh, who just gets it all right and, and walks away with the girl. So. I, I, I agree. I think it's more when it's more like kind of Indiana Jones, like slips when he walks and all that better yes. you know, than the one and only cool James Bond. Well, this is awesome. I can't wait to read the book. Uh, if you guys want to thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing all this information. There it is. Uh, there it is. <laughs> And uh, you know, self promotion. I can just see this the the, the opening scene, a strip club in Colombia, <laughs> in the movie. Chris Pratt. We said it's gonna play him. Yeah, Chris Pratt. We can have Elizabeth Banks. I think would be a really good Cat Sterling. There you go. So, so there you go. We have the characters <laughs> ready. Everything is. When it when is part two coming up? Or are you still? Hopefully, I'm. Uh, hopefully by next year. We'll see how yeah. it goes. Like I said, if I. I I, I get I I'll follow like Jack Carr or some of these really successful talented writers on Instagram. And I see them like typing on their computers with the mountains in the background and their cup of coffee. I'm like, I wish I could find time to do that. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, I think I, that it, that's a whole nother like when you break that like <laughs> oh I am a full time author. I think that's a different thing. Like like it, it's such a labor of love. Like do not figure <laughs> out what your hourly wage is for your book. <laughs> <laughs> when you start thinking yeah. about the amount of time you put in, like it's better to look at it as a finished product. Once again, like you gotta do it for the love of the game. Yeah. If you if you pay too too much attention to the bottom line, then you're you you'll lose sight. Or you'll get just so discouraged you're like, fuck it, <laughs> let's go do something else. And I think like <laughs> like if you like beside obviously the you know the biggest honor is like if you like somebody call you like and it and it could happen because it happened to a lot of people that I know where you call and it's like, hey, we're gonna make this a movie, whatever. But I think the best thing is like you you're in the subway, like say NYC, and you mm-hmm. see somebody reading your book. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, that's just like, you know, that's just, yeah. amazing, you know. Yeah, and, no, it trips me. It trips me out. Yeah, when people are reading my book that I never met or anything like that, it's it, it's, a, it's a really good feeling that they like it. And, uh, and the fact that they're, the fact that, you know, it's just cool that somebody would take the time. It's like anybody, any other type of art, if somebody made a really good movie, a TV show, or, the, or a comedian, you know, people are taking their time out of their, uh, their busy lives to spend money to come out there and see you perform and stuff. And, it, and even better, you get that feedback right away. If you're killing that night, um, all those things, it, 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 you can't put a price tag on it. It's almost so, something. So let me ask you this last, last question. What, well, how about Bill Burr play it? You're going to see him. Yeah. My wife. Got me book? Up, 
Yeah, well, yeah, but, yeah, that's true. I got to bring my books down. They just throw them on stage, like, like. <laughs> he's a, he's uh, a so, very good actor, by the way. Yeah. Oh, he's phenomenal. I, I enjoyed oh. him in uh, Star Wars Andalorian. Yes, I was like, that's the first thing I was thinking yeah. of, is that role. And and I don't and, know if you remember Breaking oh, and, Bad. Uh, and Breaking Bad, a better Breaking call. Breaking Bad. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't Breaking Bad. Yeah, because I I would recognize him. And my wife wasn't as into him yet, but now she likes him way a lot. Because like in Christmas, she surprised me with tickets. So we're going down to uh, North Carolina. We're going to drive down to May to go see him. So yeah, I'm super excited about it. He's a brilliant guy. Um, and it'll be great too to see his new material and stuff. Because I've, li- I've watched his other stuff at least a couple of times a piece. Yeah. Well, uh, best of luck. I can't wait to read the book. It's available on Amazon. I think I, I'll leave the link in the description of this uh, episode. People can, should check it out. But thank you so much, Andrew, where people can follow you and listen to your show and all that. I host the Political Orphanage, so-called because I am very tired of red team versus blue team slap fights. I want to figure out how things are working, get past that. Uh, Last week on the show, I flew down to McAllen, Texas, specifically to check out the border situation. I met with uh, former Border Patrol chiefs. I met with people in agriculture. I went to Catholic charities. So I, I did actual, you know, gumshoe running around trying to see the situation. Um, uh, this week, I have on an attorney talking about RICO law and what all's going on with Trump and Georgia. Uh, and that is all, all on the political orphanage. So if you find me more charming than grading and you like learning about stuff rather than just are the Republicans or the Democrats evil, check out the political orphanage. And I think when Trump wins, is going to be, if he wins, is going to be uh, the first Secret Service that, uh, you know, in charge of just his tweets. It's like, don't, like, you have to protect him. That's his main danger. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, do, you, do, you, do you have any final thoughts on that, Mark, before you tell us where people can find you on the, the, on the Biden versus Trump um, real No, I think I, 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 I like uh, Andrew's description of, 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 you know, being outside of both sides of things. I think you know, be a pundit, but yeah, it's like, I think a lot of things are driven by the people on extremes of either end. I mean, yeah. just watching from afar on the sideline, you can see that. And I think most people are in the middle and actually it's just, I think the political landscape, the social media, the, 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 the mainstream, you know, the cable news shows and all that stuff kind of uh, d- drives those wedges and, and creates those passions and stuff. And if, if you take politics, if politics is too big a part of your life, then you probably need to reorder your life or take a good hard look at it and, and find better meaning in things that really matter than politics. If you're that, if you're that strung up or that uh, worked up about these sort of things, that's my personal opinion. I uh, see, Mark, the, the, the best country in the world would be a place where you're not afraid to drink the water and you can't remember the name of the president. That to me would be a very well-functioning government. Yes. Yes. And I, I don't give me my, don't make me, get my history nerd started about how Congress should have, do its job and should yeah. be doing most of the work and not the executive branch. The executive branch is taught just that. It's to execute the laws. It's, mm-hmm. not to write, it's not to write the laws. It's not to write executive orders. It's not to rule from on high. Um, and But, you know, that's for another day. Yeah. <laughs> so where, where can people follow you for found you on Facebook, uh, Instagram, all that? The best, Instagram is probably the best place to go. It's in Brandenburg 34 uh, on Instagram. Um, that's the best place to get me. I don't have a website yet. I'm going to probably do that. But if I get this other book out, I should do that because I've done enough of these now where um, I can start posting some of these things on there. But um, yeah, that's all I got in Brandenburg 34. Uh, once again, the name uh, or the, the books, uh, Fence Jumper. I think people that listen to this, uh, these type of shows will really enjoy it. Uh, and it can be on, it's on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can order it from there. And you can email us at lifeamerica at comedyseller.com and come check a show. Chappelle was there last week. Uh, it was awesome. And uh, you never know who's going to show up, obviously. Thank you so much.